What was your latest album? The latest album is called Redemption. That's dealing with the um, stories of the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. Woe be unto him. Must have been crazy for the way he was carrying on. Oh, what an awful king. Took a lot of gold and built an idol, towering in the sky. And told everyone, you got to worship this idol, otherwise you'll surely die. He was a wicked little king. In an evil regime. He thought he was supreme, but all he did was blaspheme. Never ever get the Lord to cheer you with anger. You'll slide on a slippery slope. Nebuchadnezzar with his megalomania learned the hard way he couldn't go. Wicked little king. Wow, that's some incredible lines. Well, there's me when I'm ready, you know. Sometimes you get the inspiration. And it's not party, party, party. Something, you know, you want to get a feeling to do it, and you do it. Well, let's begin our interview here on May 4th, 2008. This is Paul Leslie of Time After Island Time, and we are pleased to present our exclusive interview with Dr. Slinger Francisco, known affectionately to some as the Birdie, ranked to the number one Calypsonian of the 20th century, the current king, the Calypso king of the world, best known as the mighty, mighty Sparrow. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Most stories are best from the beginning. So tell us. Where were you born? I was born in a little fishing village called Grand Roy in Grenada. Now you have no know to spell that, otherwise it makes no sense. Grand Roy. See, at one time the French controlled Grenada many, many moons ago, and that's where the name came from. G R A N R O. With the British. The British didn't particularly like that, so they spelled the G-R-E-N-D-R-O-Y. And they had nothing like a grand roy. But in French, it, mean, it means great king. Somebody knows that a great king was going to be born there one day. <laughs> <laughs> At eight months old, my family migrated to Trinidad and Tobago. And that was it for me. You know, like some people would tell me, well, you were, you were born in Grenada? Of course I was born in Grenada. I'm proud of that. I said, how do you know I was born in Grenada? I told you. I am at the height. I couldn't tell my mother and my father where to give birth to me. And then when they decided to migrate, like how most of the other people migrate to America for a better life, for education, housing, I was in no position to tell them anything. So... What does a, a child do? And everything I know, good, bad, and indifferent, including my honorary doctorate degrees in Trinidad. The second highest honor, the Shaconia Gold, Trinidad, Tobago. King of kings, the bird with the world. <laughs> His Excellency, the Honorable Dr. Slinger Francis for Trinidad and Grenada. What can I tell you, man? If well, you want to be mad at me for, for something, be mad at me for being an American. <laughs> That's what I did. Well, tell us about your life. What was your life like growing up? Family was poor. And I don't mean P-O-O-R. I'm talking about P-O. Family was always there for me. My mother was one of the quick thinkers. Father, nice guy, could sing. Had roots in Venezuela. That's where I got the name Francisco from. But he was so kind-hearted that he would work for people, and they would, when they didn't, they couldn't pay him. He would just come home with nothing, and then he get into an argument with her. Well, they didn't have no money. What do you want me to do? She said, "But well, you ain't got either." So she would make sure that she would always have a little something there hidden where the old people would hide the money. And so we would get 
dinner or get some something to, you know, that type of thing. And then we had a lot of friends and other family who would have help here and there. But she wanted to be independent. When you work, you get paid, and she used to work for the white people, taking care of the kids and cooking for them and doing everything just to get a few shillings at the end of the day, end of the week, rather, so that I can get some good treatment, you know, to go to school, see my clothes all washed and clean and fresh in them days with a short khaki pants. <laughs> And everything was all right, you know, just that, you know, we didn't have the important things all the time. But the love was there, you know, and some people would tell you, no, I grew up with my aunt, I grew up with my grandmother, I grew up with my cousin and that type of thing. Well, I think I have a little edge there saying I grew up with my mother and my father. Moving on to the music, when did you first become aware of Calypso music? Second place. When did you become aware of Calypso music? Calypso is all around me. That's like, you know, rap or rap music or rock and roll, if you wish, around the average American youngster. Everywhere you turn, you hear some kind of some boom, do that, do that music, <laughs> and it all depends which one you like and. You get into it, and then you get a chance to show your friends what you learn and and that type of thing. And there were so many great Calypsonians around. But they weren't in Trinidad at the time. Most of them uh, had migrated to the United States and England. So after a while, I became like a youngster, but with a good opportunity. The, the, the big stars weren't there presently to knock me off. Knock me off my feet. But they would send records, for instance, like Lord Kitchener. He was one of the greatest ever. He would send records down, and whether he sent it on personally or his, his record company sent it, it came down. It used to be big hits and, and win the road march. And well, ever since I came on the scene professionally in 1950, Fifty-five, Kitchener hadn't won a road march until I went back and brought him from England to Harry Belafonte. Well, she was to Harry Belafonte because of Harry Belafonte. It's a long story. See, there was always a two-sum in entertainment, and one, and 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 you know, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, Ozzy and Harriet, and uh, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, and. All was a, a, a twosome. And what, what happened to me was Melody and I, Lord Melody, we became very good friends, even though he was the first man to put me and give me real nervous, I mean, very nervous on the stage. Imagine I get my opportunity to make a first appearance on stage and Lord Melody going to announce me in this way. Ladies and gentlemen, I have this young fellow here in the backstage always bothering me. He want a chance to think. Well, Tonight is his night. If you like him, clap. If you don't, and then he put thumbs down. God <laughs> <laughs> damn! I wish <laughs> I want to tell him. I want no more chance. <laughs> Nervously, I went out there and did what I had to do. At one time, people thought I was dancing, dancing, nervous. <laughs> this right. Funnily enough, after a while, the remarks that they use, and that's how I got my name. Why don't you stand and sing like everybody else, man? You know, you keep jumping around the stage like a damn little sparrow. <laughs> this was supposed to, to belittle me. And when I realized what they're trying to do, I know that when you, the more you try to duck away from a, from a name, it's the more it sticks to you. So I added mighty to it. But they ain't nothing like a mighty fellow. Except me. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to have a name like Dup Dep Charge or Torpedo. Just like some of these other fellas, you know, they had Lion and Tiger and Growl the Killer, the Execute, the Viper. Even the Lord Kitchener was named after, you know, some great warlord in, in from England. 
But that's how it went, you know, to, to show people how powerful you are. By the strength of your name sounding that way, people will, be, will, will see you in higher esteem. I mean, if, if the lion is going to tell a story and the sparrow is going to tell the same story, who are you going to believe more? So when I realize that I'm going to be stuck with sparrow, sparrow, humble little bird, not even as good as a hummingbird, he can just jump in from branch to branch, from limb to limb. So I say, okay, I'm not fake that. <laughs> mighty sparrow, here comes the mighty sparrow. So much so I, I introduced my own self in years, 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 as years went on. What is it that you liked about Calypso? Oh, the humor. I like the, the beat. It was a little slow for me, but I didn't really realize how slow it was until I started, you know, making my uh, live appearances. And it was natural for me to be a little faster. So that is why I sort of changed the tempo, which a lot of people didn't realize then, except when I sing in the Jean and Dinah, Rosita and Clementine, which was, which is nothing compared to uh, what what's happening now. But they tell me I was singing too far. People won't understand what I'm saying. And three years later, 1961, I give them one call, 10 to 1 is murder. That was really fast. But by today's standard, it's mediocre. 10 to 1 is murder. Criminal attack me outside the mirama. Ten to one is moda. Doom pa. Two bidi bidi two poop pam pa da. Ten to one is moda. That was an incident that took place, and that was my side of the story. Hmm. <laughs> I was my own lawyer. <laughs> Very good. Look today, my 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 last daughter is a lawyer. Is a is a legal lawyer. She just passed the bar, and she 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 graduated from me today. St. John's University, and she passed the bar right here in New York, and now she's working on a big firm. She's a lawyer, but I was a lawyer before her, so anytime she she tried to, to pick on me, I say, girl, let me tell you something. Because she picked on me at one time, you know, I, when I threw a graduation party for her, cost me over $6,000, and I was just showing off, you know. She came in between me and my boys, because she said, listen, let me tell you something, Dad. You gotta change your ways. I said, change my ways? What you mean by She said, I won't be able to defend you. I said, oh? I said, why not? She said, I'll be on the prosecutor's side. I looked at her and everybody was laughing at me. So I said to her, girl, let me tell you something. Half drunk, eh? Let me tell you something. You see that brain you got there? I only loan it to you. <laughs> So don't think you're smarter than me. <laughs> he almost fell off. <laughs> Everybody cracked up. The <laughs> that man, he could think on his feet whether he's so very drunk. <laughs> a minute ago, you were singing a line from Dean and Dinah. Yeah. And the Calypsonian Gabby, he once said that your 1956 song, Dean and Dinah, is the Calypso masterpiece. So, Dean and Dinah. But tell us about that song. You see, there was a military base in Trinidad. So all there's and the sailors, the marines, and all the different people who they had. And it was very strategic to have a military base in different places, you know, like I suppose in Guam, in Hawaii, and Trinidad, and all over, because, it's, you know, it's good for security. When the planes used to pass overhead at night, there used to be this big flashlight shining through the clouds to identify who the... And as I am a youngster, I'm seeing all this kind of thing. And me and all the American personnel down there, whenever we meet them, you know, we all, we all like them. Hi, Joe. How you doing? Everybody was Joe. Hi, Joe. What's up, man? We never even went down to the military base, but we talk in Yankee. Hi, Joe. Everything all right? Yeah, man. <laughs> but you see, the Americans used to control all the nightlife. And then now after I started reaching my my peak, I started getting a little bit, I don't want to say angry, but jealous. I mean, you know, you, you got everything, man. Why don't you leave this one for me, you know? Girls that you know, you know, you all went to school together. Sometimes, you know, in, in a mixed school or something, they went to a, their school, but you were nearby, you knew them. 
And then all of a sudden, Americans got married to this one, took this one away, got this one pregnant. And anyway, in the long run, those in the club where we used to go hang out and sing would tell you every once in a while, I ain't got no damn time with you, you know, so because I got my Yankee man and me ain't got no time with you, so you better go away. Well, we could do nothing. All we could do is, Joe is my boy, man, but Joe is taking everything away. You know, what's going on? Up comes Mr. Eric Williams, Dr. Eric Williams, the first prime minister of Trinidad. In those days, he was not the prime minister. He was just the, the first, how do you call it again? The premier. Before we got independence, long before we got independence. And he was trying to point out some of the things that went on with the occupation of the, the military base in Trinidad. Some of the best lands you could think about with all the wonderful beaches and if and kiss and when Trinidad wants to develop, eventually they will have to go to that part of the world to become, you know, like the French Riviera. So he tried to get them to leave because it was not legal what they did. You're going to you can't occupy a country like that. That's what he said. Now, we didn't know the difference between occupation and, and terrorism or any kind of ism, <laughs> whatever it may have. So he pointed out to him, up to put to them. And at that time, they realized that he was right, that he was a brilliant mind. In addition to that, according to them, Trinidad was not all that strategically important anymore at that time. So they decided they're going to leave. So here comes Joe, my boy Joe, leaving just around that time. I had made a song. That same song was not supposed to be a regular calypso. It was supposed to be an advertisement for a store. You know, there were other Californians singing about different things, including the same Lord Melody. He had a song singing about Glamour Girl, Lingerie, Lingerie, or you want to pronounce it. Darling, I am going out shopping. How you want me to bring you this morning? I want you to make it clear. And he had a deep voice, you know. I want you to make it clear. A whole box of dainty underwear. And things like that. Now, I'm looking around. And this big store in Trinidad, one of the biggest. And they were making money hand over foot. I didn't know where he was going on. I had no training in that. First of all, you should realize I have never attended the high incubators of knowledge and wisdom. So I ain't got them kind of brains. But just talent was there. And I made a song with Gina and Dinah, Rosita and Clementina. Came to me one morning after they complete their shopping. They told me, honey, I never had more luxury, more than when I stopped. And went into Salvatore to shop. And Salvatore was the biggest store in the city. So I say, well, why Salvatore advertising all his glamour girl lingerie and cannings and different little things that these other guys singing about? There's nothing compared to... <laughs> so I went to Salvatore with it and let them know, well, you know, I think I got a gem here for you. And there was a fellow named Jean Anthony. I don't know if he was French, but it sounded like you know, his name... G-E-N, Anthony. Either Italian or French, whatever it is. Or maybe, maybe. But he was a nice guy, you know. But he would tell me every time I tell him well, what I have done and things. Sometimes he he would say, come back. Not sometimes. Every time I go, he said to me, come back. Come back. I don't have the time now, but I'll talk to you later. Come back next week. After about six weeks of going back, the man got tired of me. I was too persistent. Was... annoying him. So eventually he took me to the cashier and told the cashier, give him two dollars. He says he had some nice song there for us, but we're not interested. Give him two dollars for his time. Thank you very much. I'm watching this guy, sympathetic man, he won't hear this song. What's going on? He ain't even interested in the song. It's like you telling Texaco and Shell and 
that song that you got a song with them. They don't, they, you know, it's, it's no big deal to them. They, you know, they got things going. You mentioned a couple of the, the Calypsonians that you admire, like the Lord Kitchener. When you were growing up, who did you consider to be the great Calypsonians? There were so many of them. Lion, I think, Lion, Tiger, Rolla. Lord Kitchener, I was a fan of by hearing his songs. I didn't know him. He started in 1946 in Trinidad. He sang in 1946, 1947, and 1948. He left for England, and he never came back, not even for a holiday. I was a, like, you know, he was, to me, it's like, oh, of not King Cole or Frank Sinatra, or, which is, incidentally, I came to, to, I was able to meet them, you know, later on in, in, in Jacob. And I had the opportunity to sing for Nat King Cole. And when people asked me, what's your claim to fame? I said, I sang for Nat King Cole. Mm-hmm. What did you sing? Darling, there was a book. Jenny, they what to do. You know? <laughs> I'm trying to sing his song. Like him. For him. <laughs> <laughs> you were pretty convincing, I have to say. Tell you what, and he looked at me, said, man, you, you, you're all right, you're all right. You know, we sort of hit it off. But, and as I was, grew older and, you know, and, and started uh, coming up to the United States and, and we said, have the 8 one visa in the then days, I think. I got to meet Sam Cook and Jackie Wilson and we used to be performing on the same stage, not that we were uh, close friends. I mean, you know, I'm just glad to be there with them. But those two in particular, I was close friends with with, with our book friend, and later on, and he said, whenever he came to Trinidad, he would come to my house. And I remember the first time he came down to my house, I was so happy to drive him from the the airport to, down to my house. I was going so fast, and I'm driving on the wrong side of the road. He was nervous. He, what, what you doing? <laughs> he think I'm driving on the wrong side, but our side is, your, is, is his wrong side. So when he see another car coming, he would hide his head. You, God damn. What, what? <laughs> <laughs> you remind me of Barack when I first met Barack, you know. He was just so warm. My God, come here, boy. What you doing? God damn. And I made a song for Barack, so I, I gave it to him. Anyway, just come back to these other Calypsonians again. Um, Lord Kitchener was, like I was telling you, you know, the story seemed to be going to hear and there. It was a two thumb. And when Harry Belafonte sang my song, Gina and Dinah, I was happy because I know I'm going to get some money at this, like, the guy who made rum and Coca-Cola, Lord Invader, he, his song was sung by the Andrews sisters and they made money and he eventually got a lot of money and so we say, well, it's no big problem. You know, when an American star sings your song, you can get some money. So he knew it. He got a long story short. Me and Melody, who had teamed up, the same guy who messed me up the first time putting me on stage, years past, we became very close friends. We traveled through Guyana, Grenada, St. Lucia, Martinique, Guadeloupe, all over the Caribbean. And eventually, we came up to the States to meet Harry Belafonte and to get that kind of money that we were looking for. Well, anyway, we didn't get that amount of money. We got a little something. Cause Harry was all right. But Melody wanted to be one of the hangers-on with Harry Belafonte. And what I wanted, Harry Belafonte, was to introduce me to a few people to, you know, to open some doors for me. Eventually, he introduced me to Dorothy Kilgallen and a fellow named Dick Olmar. He used to run the left bank of the nightclub, a restaurant right near to the Madison Square Garden. And I started doing some work there, singing with my guitar, going around, you know. A lovely lady sitting on the chair. Oh, you look like the daughter of a millionaire. I don't think I'm rude, but I wish you would give me some of your food. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're not as stupid as that, you know, but you know, you would, <clears throat> you would say things like that. We kept on, you know, it's time, I finished, it's time for carnival. 
gone back to Trinidad. Well, one year I I wasn't ready to go down to Trinidad at that time. I was I wanted to to have myself more entrenched in in what's happening over here, Miss Carnival that year. I think that was nineteen fifty seven. Boy, and these people down there in Trinidad almost killed me. And I had to make a song. I rode on back home. They used to heckle me, heckle me very, very bad here in Trinidad. Until I take a trip to the USA just to get out of the way. Mama, every day the mailman coming. So many letters he bring in. Before he walk out the hall, I get a overseas call. Hey, Faro, back home. Don't leave we alone. Sparrow, come back home. If you hear the cry, Sparrow, come back home. You never miss the water till the well run dry. <laughs> anyway, when I reach back now in the same song, the same people who were so in the song saying to come back home and they miss me and, oh man, come on, what's you, you can't do that to us here. The song ended up with them watching at me and saying, look at him, look the hog, get it bunked to come back, you dirty dog. <laughs> After all these letters and all these phone calls that I said in the song. So it was a lot of humor and different things for me. And I was telling you about the, the military base and, and when uh, Dr. Williams objected to the occupation of the island and they were doing anything they wanted. And I had the Gene and Diana at the same time fighting them on one hand. Then I'm getting to hear the story about the military base is not legal and lawfully occupied. So I made another song. Long, long ago, we didn't even know, not even a trip. No, you, you hear the tempo? Yeah, that's the kind of tempo that used to go on. Long, long ago, we didn't even know. Not even my trip. Nobody said Jagaramas was exchanged for a few old battleships. So when we went after Yankees to move, they really didn't care. They refused to go. They said the place is there for at least 99 years. But when we asked the chief minister, he said, no, it isn't even registered. It's not sealed, nor stamped. Somebody is a big, big scamp. If they go remain, let it take the Caroni Swamp. Now, the Caroni Swamp is supposed to be a place that he did not hold in high esteem. You know? And it, it well, of course, it was a messy place. Not like the Chagoramas Bay or the Chagoramas area. That was one of the best parts of the island. Anyway, he, he eventually ran for election and he won by one seat. And I was now in 1956. So I sort of associated myself with him because I won in 1956 the crown. I became the, the king. And he won in 56 also. But when the argument broke out, I used to tell them and his supporters, let me tell you something. I won before him, you know. I won in February. He won in September. That's when they had the election. So I was king in February. So don't be talking to me like that. You know, I was king before him. <laughs> <laughs> Still again making fun. And I suppose that's how I am, you know, talk a lot of foolishness and sing and make people dance and that type of thing. But sometimes again, I put myself in trouble. <laughs> I found myself in some deep, deep nonsense with one of the, the, the government of the day some years later on I sang a song that they didn't like and they audited me what, what was that song? it's called Prophet of Gloom and Doom if you happen to see and know when politics going wrong with facts and figures prepared to show it's better to bite your song to them political boss who the people trust and get double cross you're an obstacle to be removed at any cost a social conscience is really very dangerous to your health 
the awesome strength of the powers that be most certainly will be felt to tell them that their priorities and performance is on the path. It's poetic to hear them describe to you who you are. First they call you megalomaniac, a power seeker, a crazy or a crap troublemaker. And if you dare tell them the economy is no longer in full bloom, then you become a prophet of gloom and doom. <laughs> you are quite a bard. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, they looked at me and they said, oh, so you want to, you, you, you think you have all the answers? And I learned the hard way. They took over $387,000 from me. Well, I had to, luckily I had property. I had to sell this one and sell that and get a cash and get a loan. And, and ever since then, my auditor, my certified public accountant and different people, you know, to, to handle that sort of thing for me. Because, you know, in the old days, you were entertainer, man. You know, like, like you're talking about Bo Diddley and, and, and Mom Mabley. We worked this week. We didn't work the month before, we, but we got something. For, who the hell is keeping books? And they know that. So they took advantage of me. And tons of, but what a way it is. Maybe they taught me to to be more astute and aware of the fact that you can't just continue to be picking on people who, you know, who got the power. Tell them in the song, questionable deal made it hate, continue to grow and grow. Blatant refusals have replaced the people's right to know. Anyway, that, that was a long time ago. I think that was 1987, When someone hears one of your albums or they see you perform, they see you sing, what do you hope it is that people get out of that experience? Whatever the song says. If it's a humorous song, I want to see them laughing, carrying on. If it's an up-tempo, I'm going to make sure that I do my boogie-woogie and on the stage and, you know, it says James Brown used to say he's the hardest man in show business. And I adopted something from him. I say I'm the busiest man in show business. <laughs> I'm always busy going someplace, Australia, Japan, Vancouver, back to the Caribbean, all over the United States. Well, the Caribbean people, some of them started getting mad with me. You know what? When you were growing up, you, 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 you used us, you know, you and Melody. And now, here you, you ain't got time for us. So now I had to make sure the Caribbean people, when I say no, not right now, by then, I had to make the Caribbean people a, a regular part of what I'm doing. And then there were several other Californians who we encouraged as time went on, and they have their own stars that don't really need us. You know, like all in Antigua, they have short shirts and Swallow and Obstinate and in Barbados, they have Gabby and, and uh, just the name of you in, 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 in the old days. Even have they have good female singers, singers, Rihanna and all of them. Well, what about those, those newer Calypsonians? Who of those do you think are really carrying on the tradition well? Well, what has happened is that Money started playing a serious part in the development and the projection of the platform. So the music is no longer humorous, political as it used to be. It's more party, party music, and the young ones who are involved. The biggest one, I think, would be Marshall Montano. There are several others, but the first name came to mind. And he was always one of our favorites, you know. Kitchener and myself sort of lifted him up, and we have a picture <laughs> when he was young, wearing pampers, hmm. <laughs> singing. Well, of course he was a he was a bigger guy, but but being that age, he looked like this kind that would fit in pampers, and he was you know, a big body and that kind of thing, you know. So, but he was singing, following the footsteps of his teacher, and he won that yeah, and the, the the junior, you know, junior king. 
There were several other Californians around there. There are good ones now, and there are lots of female singers. In the old days, you had the whole white, you had Lady Irie, and then came a superstar, Calypso Rose. She knocked everybody off the the feet, even some of the men. I'm one of the guys that she can't say she beat. (laughs) Ain't no way she beat me and knocked out for six. Home run. That rose don't mess with the king. <laughs> and she was just on our show last week, and she had to give you a lot of respect. She, she did. Yes, she did. Yeah. She said she had a lot of respect for the mighty sparrow. And it seems like everyone I've talked to has said, as far as Calypso, you can't be him. He's the king. So you are the Calypso king of the world. And they like they like when I introduce myself, you know. And I, when 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 the the MC, you know, some in some places he don't know too much about Calypso and what's going on. I say, man, what are you gonna do? I say, well, you know what? You got two microphones. Okay, I'm gonna stay in the back of the stage and I'm gonna introduce myself. And he, I'm just just when he hears me saying the mighty mighty, he would just walk on the stage. And I woke something out with the drummer. Ladies and gentlemen, put you say the kind of uh, on a voice that we put on? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached where the air is rare. Only one Calypsonian have gotten there. Way beyond the realm of anyone's dreams, where royalty reigns supreme, we have found him. Indeed, we have found him. Unrivaled, unbridled, prestigious and pristine. Now, ever since he captured and conquered the Calypso regime, he has kept it in the highest esteem. And I want to present, ladies and gentlemen, this Serenade Supreme, who at the time was marginally 18, but he made a ladies' daydream and a young girl's dream. (laughs) Please, let's rise, as we present majestically none other than His Excellency, the Honorable Dr. Slinger Francisco, Known as the bird with the word in Nigeria. He is known as Chief Omawali of Ikoi. This time all the, the drummer is just rolling. <laughs> you understand? Getting more excited like me. So here he is, ladies and gentlemen. The Calypso king of the world. The mighty, mighty Sparrow. Sparrow. That's when the, 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 the real announcer are going on out now. Sparrow. Sparrow. <laughs> and the band start to kung fi tung ding to king ki tung ding to king ki tung ding to king ki tung. But these guys, they say, you know, Paro, you got to be, you miss your fall, I don't know, you should be a damn comedian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you, you come down to Georgia, the Atlanta or Athens, Georgia area, because I'd love to see you. In, in action? In action. Oh, man, don't try to keep up with me, because you better be young and strong. <laughs> if you're my age, don't worry about it. Sit down and just shake your head. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, and I am scheduled to be down there sometime. I'm not quite sure because they haven't signed the contract and, and do what they're supposed to do yet, you know, like send a deposit and make an arrangement with the airline tickets and so on. But I suppose we, they, they think we have time, but I only hope that the date is available still when they are ready. How do you pick who gets to announce you on stage? Oh, no, they... they, they, um, they, they, they the, the promoters, they would tell me, well, this is the guy who's handling the stage. You tell him what you're going to sing when you, you know. And But if there's somebody there who I know is of good quality, the, the, the person who can really get on and, you know, get involved. Sometimes you have a guy who is so, so laid back. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the where the star is going to shine for you. And please, let's pay attention now. He is the Calypso King of the World, and his name is Flinger Francisco, but his Calypso name is the Mighty Sparrow. So let's put our hands together, the Mighty Sparrow. That kind of laid-back thing here for me. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, come on now. Are you ready? You ready for some action? Come on. (laughs) <laughs> Here comes the king. The bird with the wood. Look at him. Are you ready? Come on. Everybody's waiting for you. One, 
So you gotta put some, some, you hype it up. If you don't want to hype, hype it up, it's up to you, but if you, if you have that, you know, like I say, the, 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 the level of sincerity in your presentation, and you can make the people sit and think, that can also make me change my first or second song. Because if somebody come in, you know, representing you for some school children or a church group or something, I would sing something else. Like when I, instead of coming out with Gene and Dinah or coming out with the Lizard or Mimi or Sandra or some one of them thing, I will come out with like, tell St. Peter. But to the, 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 the CD, the, my latest CD, uh, Redemption. Have, uh, have I heard it yet? Is that what you're asking? No, I haven't heard that album yet. Well, it says, I know deep in my heart I'm going on up, riding in that golden chariot, trumpet sounding the alarm, and angels with the heavenly charm to welcome me on through the pearly gate. As we meet and as we greet, there's joyfulness throughout the street, because in Jesus' name we start to celebrate. So you just tell St. Peter, I'll be there. <laughs> Tell St. Peter, I'll be there with all my sins forgiven and all my friends up there in heaven, except two. I said, who is it two? I said, Melody and Kitchener. <laughs> 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 I was telling you the story with Mel Melody. You see, when I tell you, there was always a twosome. And that twosome in, in, in the Caribbean was me and Melody. And when we came up for the money thing with Harry Belafonte, we got whatever money we got. And But Melody wanted to stay with Harry Belafonte. He stayed, and I had to go back and, and that type of thing. And that's when I decided, you know what? Kitchener has always been a fan of mine, a, a, a good favorite of mine. And I, he never, I never saw him alive, you know, live performing. And I know he is doing good in England. So I went to England when I had the opportunity and brought him back couple of years later, and since then, Melody stayed with Harry for a while, and me and Kitchener developed a good relationship, and he started crossing me out and telling me, well, he didn't want to sing on the same stage with that Grenadian. And we did a few things together, you know, we started the Clash of the Giants and all the road march and so on, but when he would win road march, I would win in the Monarch. You see, so some of the people say, I mean, you're too stupid. You could have won the road march too, but you have no right to bring him back. I said, well, I didn't care about that. I just wanted him to be there, you know, to continue that two sum. What about a Lou Costello, you know, that sort of thing? Right. Okay. You are the Calypso King of the world, and I know that Harry Belafonte was called the Calypso King, and that was a title that he never approved of, and he never liked to be called that because he'd never considered himself a Calypsonian. But I noticed on one of your albums that you, at the live album, you called him a great singer. And you even covered his song, the, the signature song, Jamaica Farewell. Yeah, yeah, Harry is all right. You know, listen, I, I, I wouldn't hide it. You know, if I thought that he was good, just like how I thought Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra, you should hear me sing Frank Sinatra's song, My Way. Man, you would think Frank Sinatra was singing my way. Wow. <laughs> well, one of my favorite songs of yours is the song, Mama, This Is My... That's Kitchener. That's, your, that's a Kitchener song? Hey, Mama, this is my... This is my song, class. In the band, we'll be hugging up the man. da da ding da 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 Something, I can't remember the lyrics now. Just You oh. never performed it? No. No, okay. I was listening to that compilation album and they where you and Kitchener switch yeah. songs and they a lot of the a lot of them they blend so well together. So maybe that's where I got my confusion. But he was he was very, very good. And um I was the one who sort of gave the, 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 the steel bands men a voice in, in, in Calypso. So from the the higher echelons in the society. He would sing songs that would be for the pan and make them, you know, especially for the pan. 
But no, my my approach to it was to get the the hierarchy on the oligarchs of the society to pay attention to the contribution that the steel ban has made. And I came up with one of the classics called from the university, the steel ban man, historian, Mr. Politan. Tell me when you're going to write the history of pan you're taking steel ban for granted. Stating it always will be wrong. But when, how it all started, you make no mention. Documentation can't be found. And with the same steel band beat, try the NCC or the university and tell me if you see any steel band history for posterity. Boom, boom, boom. If the steel band must grow, the children must know the trials and tribulations of long ago. Come on! (laughs) (laughs) To you, in your opinion, what makes a Calypso song a Calypso song? Well, as long as it's from the Caribbean, especially Trinidad and Tobago. Well, I mean, I mean, they come up with all kind of parang and different things, but definitely Calypso. Most decidedly. Well, when you're down there in the Caribbean, other than when you're singing and performing and doing these Calypso shows, what is it that you like to do down there? When when you're not working. Not working. <laughs> well, I hang out with my grandchildren and my kids, and who are just some of them taller than me. <laughs> but my grandkids are the ones who who rule the roof now. In the days when the lands were, was, was cheap, I bought some lands, a couple of acres down there in Digo Martin. And people would ask me from time to time, what about that place you had down there? You still have it? I said, no. Oh, the bank took it away from you? I said, no. I said, well, what do you mean? But you just told me you didn't have it. I said, well, I don't have it. I said, well, who have it? I said, my children and my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I always try to make a joke of many things, you know, and to me it makes sense. You recently returned from the Virgin Islands where you're performing, and I know that you travel around a lot. What is your favorite country to perform in? Favorite country? Well, it will have to be the country that give me more work and put more money in my pocket, and that's where I am right here, the USA. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are many other places that do well and people love you and that kind of thing, but you don't make the kind of money that you make in in the United States. So, in answer directly to your question, the U.S. of A. Kind of going along the international line, there's a lot of great places to eat in the world. And this may sound like a strange question, but I really want to know the answer. <laughs> I really like eating international cuisine. Just the other day, I was eating some curry from a place in Athens, Georgia. If you ever play in Athens, Georgia, you'll have to eat at this restaurant called Kelly's. I really like Caribbean food, so I was wondering, what is your all-time favorite meal? I'm a fish man. I, my father grew me up on fish. I told you he was poor. He couldn't afford all the chicken and the beef and the pork that the neighbors would be chewing and cooking on the weekend, man. Sometimes I used to get kind of mad. All my friends they eat it. I could smell the food. <laughs> and sometimes I hang out with them, you know, until they get to realize what I was doing. So some of them, there was one guy in particular, said, go home, go home. I said, I mean, go home. You see, you're waiting for his food. Because, you know, lunchtime, his mother would always come out and say, would you like to have something to eat with us? Yes. Okay, I will tell your mother that you're here. And then I go and I eat my food, you know, and this is not the kind of food that I normally would get in my house. My father would make sure that I get some fresh fish every day. I didn't know the value of fish, but I, I must have ate too much. I got tired of it. So when I got an opportunity to eat something else from the neighbors, it's free. They used to pick on me in that kind of way. Sometimes you end up with a few fish sticks. <laughs> Come back. But all in all, fish, and, and, and after having gotten to know the, the, the value of good fresh fish, man, you can't stop me from eating fish. 
fish in the morning, fish in the evening. Every once in a while, you know, we eat some chicken, but. And then again, as soon as I started eating it, I realized that, you know, this is not really what is good for you. Yeah, fish is certainly the, the healthiest. Is there a song of yours that is a favorite? Favorite? I mean, I got so many favorites. The Architects of Economic Slavery. Have you heard that one? I have not. When does someone really become a good citizen? I'd like to know for sure. Why, when the ordinary man disagrees with the establishment, they call it treason. And why should they persecute a brother for seeking black power? Don't they know a blind man could see that this is blatant hypocrisy? The real traitors and them are all high in society. And the government protecting all of them and penalizing you and me. And in a million different ways, they violate the law. Is this same good, no good bastard who oppress the poor? With a false declaration, tax evasion, defrauding customs duty, these good citizens are the architects of economic slavery. <laughs> you know what? They got mad at me. You're certainly a very accomplished man. What accomplishment are you most proud of? I would think that I have grown up fast enough and got to the reality of the situation that all is not 100% good with you. You know, you know, that, or how I put it my way is that, hey, you know, your shit and sugar. <laughs> 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 so stop feeling like that. Stop thinking that everybody must worship you and bow down to you and carry on and you can stay and do anything you want. And auditing me sort of brought that to, more to reality than anything else. I wanted to talk a little bit about, just for a minute, about the movie that you're in called Calypso Dream. Have you seen that film? Not in its entirety. I saw when they were screening it, uh, and Superior and my friend in L.A., they sort of own it. Superior is one of the Californians that was there with me when I was singing, you know, singing on each other, improvising. Name I can't remember the name right now, man. Ever since I've been using this new hair grease here, my mind keeps slipping. You know what I'm saying? The filmmaker, you mean? Yeah. Jeffrey Dunn? Jeffrey, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Nice guy. How is he feeling these days? He's doing okay. I haven't seen the film yet either, but I'm excited to see it. Another one of your great songs is called Obey a Wedding. Tell us about that one. Well, you know, sometimes when a girl <clears throat> finds herself in trouble with a man that she can't control because they're used to controlling men as they want, and they can't control me, she decided to go to some one of these voodoo places and give the people my name. And whatever little piece of my clothing she could get, so they could work something on me, so that I, I can, I not get away from marrying her. So the song is self-explanatory. It's a good song. Thank you, like it, but don't don't do find yourself in that situation, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one final question. This show is going out all over the world, and since you are the Calypso King of the world, I would like to ask, what would you, Dr. Slinger Francisco, the Mighty Sparrow, what would the Mighty Sparrow like to say to the world? Thank you. I thank you, and I propose a toast to you. I drink to your health in the bar room, and I drink to your health in my home. I drink to your health so goddamn much, folks. Now it's time to ruin my own. <laughs> and people have been very, very, very kind to me. People have been very good, and I can't. I am 
You know, I consider myself really blessed. I may find myself from time to time, you know, in a hard position because there are certain things that I didn't quite understand, not as well educated as I should have been at the time. So things were a little bit difficult. But then all of a sudden, as soon as the door is closed in my face, the good Lord will have a window or a louver or something open and I can get some fresh air to breathe and a new way of thinking. And one thing I can tell you that I did, all my kids went to college. I feel that's a great achievement. I like that. One is a nurse, one next one is a, is a, is a lawyer, the other one is a scriptwriter for television, and, you know, the other one, the, the, the boy, he is a photographer with um, Macy's, and the other one is handling his own company down in Trinidad. They're doing, they're all doing good. But the grandkids, man, the grandkids, they're the ones who control. It has been a pleasure speaking with you, and I thank you very much for giving so generously of your time. Thank you, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen, the mighty Sparrow, the Calypso King of the World.